Nam, um, so you have the agenda um, in front of you, Nam introduced. So as we talk about ingesting, transforming, and delivering video content at scale, the topic always goes back to what can we do with the codec. The codec is at the heart of the video experience, and where is the evolution of the codec, more importantly, the video codec happening. So we've talk, we all know about HEVC and VP9, and we all know about what the Alliance for Open Media has actually done. Big thanks to AOM for what they've been doing. So to go in depth into where we are, uh, with respect to AV1, we have UA from Google who's going to be doing a deep dive on AV1 and immediately after that, we'll be talking about some real world results as well. Welcome UA. Good morning everyone. I feel very excited. Thank you, Shiv, for the great introduction. So uh, yeah, many of you may have heard about the news and test results posted by different parties of AV1. And I think it's a great opportunity to be here to uh, introduce everyone to people in video in the industry uh, from a more technical point of view. So, um, so today I would like to start from uh, introducing aliens for open media. So uh, this aliens is, uh, is a consortium of uh, the video industry. Then it first uh, started from uh, the end of 2015. Uh, driven by the goal of delivering an open video format because the early founding members have a strong feeling that we need faster pace of technology innovation. Also, we need uh, more variety to the video, uh, tr choice of video codecs besides the conventional standards. So, uh, for now, aliens, the Aliens has 36 members including uh, service providers, chip manufacturers and a lot of other companies uh, specialized in video compression technology. So besides uh, famous names in the United States, we also have a lot of international uh, partners. For example, IGE and uh, Vision Nula from China, and uh, Organ Design from UK, and uh, Ilian from uh, India, etc. So also it's a growing organization, so welcome to join AOM. Then, uh, Speaking of the development of V1, besides uh, the goal of making it royalty free and make it completely all open, then uh, another important goal is to make it optimized for hardware in the early, st uh, in the early stage of uh, codec design. So it's very great to um, get hardware partners like uh, Intel, NVIDIA, to uh, involve heavily into uh, the design phase. So it's great to, uh, the reason is the expectation for a next generation video codec from hardware side and software side are completely different. So it's great to let software engineer and the hardware engineer sit, sit down together and uh, try to convince each other and in the end make a, a reach a consensus on uh, what's best for, the, for our next codec. Then, uh, so in early uh, 2016, AV1 development started from an extension of VP9, plus a lot of features pulled from uh, Dala codec of Mozilla and the uh, Tor codec of Cisco. So from that point, more than 100 features has been proposed to the AOM working group and iterated through different subgroups before a decision of abandon or adopt can be made. Then, uh, yeah, different work groups, and also we have a top person work group to review the uh, different features to help us work to the goal of royalty free. So as of now, the bitstream, uh, including the low level coding tools, the decoding process has been freezed. Now the aliens is working hard in uh, in the process of automatic verification of AV1 spec to make sure it works, um, it will match the decoding algorithm in the reference decoder, and also to make sure that all the high level syntax work as what we expected. Now, the main part of the talk, well, I will, I'd like to cover uh, the, all the new, a bunch of new features uh, that are available in AV1 and highlight something that are really novel. So just in case uh, someone is, n is not from a compression background, so I'd like to briefly uh, talk about uh, how a video codec works from module to module. So basically a video codec will first partition a frame into blocks of different sizes. 
then each uh, coding block will be predicted from spatial reference or temporal reference. Then the prediction residual will be handled in transform domain, then quantized. Then the quantized residual, uh, quantized uh, uh, transformed residuals uh, plus the mode, all the syntax elements like coding modes, uh, partition modes, and high level syntax will be entropy coded by an uh, arithmetic coder. Then when necessary, well, we will do in-loop or out-of-loop restoration to mitigate the artifacts of compression. So I will uh, follow the flow, then the explain what's new in AV1 and highlight some new features. So let's start from by block partitioning. So AV1 block partitioning is based on a recursive quadri partition framework. Then to better serve high, high definition content, everyone started from a, su a larger super block size of 128 by 128. And the other recursive partition can be um, further, further uh, handled down to the level of four by four blocks. And at each node of the partition tree, a square block can be partitioned into 10 different patterns, including horizontal splitting, vertical splitting, and T-shaped splitting, and also the regular two by two splitting. And also we provide more flexibility uh, to signal reference frame and inter interpolation filters for smaller, smaller blocks. So we get better prediction here. So after the decoder has decided, uh, after the decoder know how the frame is partitioned, then for each uh, coding block, we'll, we'll handle it by uh, intra-prediction or inter-prediction. Then for intra-prediction, the standard way to do it is to generate a prediction block from the top and the left boundary in the same frame. Then um, the conventional way to do it is to do extrapolation uh, in different directions or do some smoothing to generate the whole block. So we first extend those, the conventional ways by adding more granularity to the extrapolation dire directions. And we also add uh, a bunch of new smoothing uh, predictors. Then also, uh, another, uh, the other cool things in uh, if you want intra is we support predicting chroma from luminance, and also there are two uh, new features specifically designed for screen captures and other artificial contents. So the, for the conventional modes, firstly we extend uh, from eight extrapolation angles to, uh, 56, uh, to 56 angles. Then for the smooth predictors, besides DC prediction, we support uh, smooth predictors that uh, do quadratic interpolation to capture the gradual changes in the texture, and also support pious predictor, which adopts a reference from uh, the direction of lower gradient. We also support uh, another pre-designed uh, pre -designed future, another uh, family of pre-design filters, which uh, basically view the image signal as a Markovian process to capture the evolution of correlation with the reference uh, boundaries. Besides the conventional intra-predictors, uh, another cool feature for the color plane is we can pre predict the AC component of chrominance from the AC component of subsample luminance block in, um, in AV1. Then the way to do such kind of prediction will be directly signaled in a bit stream. So it's pretty uh, light for the decoder. Then we also handled artificial contents very carefully. One new feature is called color palette mode. Now the concept is uh, many blocks in the screen captures can be approximated by only a few unique colors. So to represent it, in AV1, we can represent such color palette for a block by first sending an anchor color palette in consists of two or eight colors, then send a color index map to indicate for each pixel location which color we want, we, uh, we want to copy from there. Then another cool feature is called intra-block copying. The concept is very simple, but it works effectively. The concept is uh, the intracoder can refer to previously reconstructed blocks in the same frame 
by simulating an intra-frame motion vector. And it's very helpful for screen captures with a lot of text and repetitive patterns. So in the example here, we, we did uh, we tried encoding a screen capture of Wikipedia. You can see all of the English letters can be um, reused again and again. And actually, for conventional video codecs, it's very hard to, uh, to predict uh, the letters. So yeah, that's pretty much for intra-prediction. Then uh, here, intra-prediction actually is a more fundamental and a core module for video coding. So the contact will be richer. So basically, for, uh, for conventional uh, intercoder, it will be a block-based uh, translational motion compensation. So first, for everyone, we extend uh, this uh, conventional framework by uh, extending the reference frame pool and also doing smarter when we signal the motion vectors and also have more flexible subpixel interpolation here. Besides that, we also ex extended the framework uh, by introducing new concepts like overlapped prediction and uh, per pixel uh, weighted compound prediction. And also, one cool thing is, besides translational motion, we finally made warped motion work in the video codec. So uh, yeah, for the conventional framework, first, uh, the reference frames. VPNA has supported three, uh, support a block to choose one or two reference frames from a pool of three reference frames. Then everyone will extend a pool to seven reference frames, including uh, four past frames and uh, three future frames. Uh, uh, two future frames are temporal future, future frame, and one, future, one frame is unfutured, near future, uh, near uh, backward prediction frame. Then a block can pick one or two from them to do either single prediction or compound prediction. And specifically for compound prediction, everyone also supports unidirectional compound, which means the, uh, both the reference frames came from the same side of the current frame, which is quite fairly flexible and uh, might be useful in our um, real-time coding. So after the reference frame has been determined, we, uh, re we also redesigned the way to signal motion vector. So to signal motion vector, directly signaling in the bitstream will be uh, too expensive for the codec. Then what we do here is we uh, generate motion vector references from either spatial neighbors or from uh, some temporal, tem from temporal reference, like uh, estimated from uh, the motion trajectory. So for the spatial motion vector prediction, everyone uh, will search in a deeper neighborhood than VP9 and construct a separate pool for single reference or some unique uh, compound reference frame pair. Then the new thing here is the temporal motion vector uh, prediction. The idea is we uh, pre-store the motion trajectory uh, uh, pulled from our previously coded frames and if a motion trajectory passed the current block, we will project the motion trajectory to, uh, from current block to the uh, signal, the reference frame. Then that's how we, cap, cap, how we generate a temporal motion vector prediction. And by doing so, the codec is able to capture the, the have a better tr track of the motion field uh, if it has various, various kind of velocity in the neighborhood. Then uh, after the temporal and spatial te candidates are gathered, in every one, we will uh, carefully uh, score each candidate by, by the likelihood of uh, the motion vector is uh, precise and merge the candidates uh, that are duplicate of each other and rank all the distinct candidates. And the chosen uh, motion vector reference will be index coded, um, which is adaptive to the size of the candidate pool. Then after the motion vector is determined, it's very possible it's a sub-pixel motion vector, not an integer one. So we support sep uh, separate, uh, uh, separate um, interpolation strengths in horizontal and vertical direction. And we design some algorithm to signal it uh, efficiently. 
So this is uh, basically how we do the conventional motion compensation. So we also extend the framework to support overlapped motion compensation and uh, weighted motion compensation. So overlap the block motion compensation, probably people from compression background may know the, uh, the item called OBMC. So the idea is, uh, although we only signal one motion vector for each block, but each block have access to other uh, motion vectors in the neighborhood. So why not use all of them? Then, uh, so, the idea, uh, so the way we do it is, um, we use neighbor, neighbor's motion vector to generate second predictors and blend those secondary predictors into areas that are close to that neighbors. So the prediction, the precision of in that, those areas are um, enhanced uh, by, pre, uh, by great amount. So, uh, and for AV1, because we support a variable block size partition, there is no way to signal how we blend them in the 2D plane, so we designed a two-sided separable uh, causal overlapping framework. Then everything can be, um, can be defined by a, pre, a few pre-designed 1D smooth feeders. And then the cool thing here is uh, we carefully designed it the, the way, uh, designed the, uh, the amount of overlapping and keep all the memory bandwidth of AV1 OBMC the same as for what we use for a, a conventional compound prediction. Then another, oh, yeah. Another feature is called master compound prediction. Uh, master compound prediction, um, well, it, this, it, it means different uh, masking technique for combining two predictors. So in VP9, we take two predictors and just average them. Then in, ma in AV1 mask prediction, we support the five different uh, uh, masking framework and three R4 combining inter and inter predictor and uh, two R4 uh, combining inter and intra predictor. And I have listed all of them here. It, this include wedge based uh, uh, masks and uh, difference modulated masks and uh, frame, different, frame distance uh, modulated masks. Uh, so the example here is uh, the wedge mask we use in AV1. We support 16 different patterns of wedge masks and combine two filters smoothly around the edge of the wedge. Uh, the, go, uh, the motivation to do so is uh, the, the edge of the moving objects will usually be uh, irregular and never, uh, never uh, exactly falls in onto the grid of block partition. So by doing so, the codex is more versatile in handling different kinds of objects and uh, different kinds of reference frames. So besides uh, translational motion, in everyone, we made it, uh, we made warps and motion composition work. So actually in computer vision, uh, using a homographic um, geometry to model motions is not a new idea, but it's really hard to do it in a scenario of compression because there are two pain points. The first pain point is how the decoder can do um, warping uh, efficiently in real time uh, decoding um, it, uh, to fulfill the requirement of real-time decoding. So uh, another pain point is um, even though, uh, uh, even if a decoder can do real-time warping, then how the uh, encoder, uh, how the, how, how we can use the signal, the uh, warping parameters efficiently in the video, uh, in video codec because we spend bits on it, right? So for the first question, if, um, we tried a lot of options for AV1. Then we end up with a six parameter FI model. And uh, one thing I need to mention is those FI models uh, needs, to be, needs to have limited degree of warping. Then the reason to limit that is if we only support small warping, then the other uh, F1 transform can be uh, can be vectorized very efficiently in hardware and SIMD 
um, by uh, implementing one horizontal share followed by one vertical share. And each step of sharing process can be done simply uh, like in a similar as what we do for standard subpixel inter interpolation. So this is how we handle the first question. The second question is how to signal the whopping models. Uh, it, it will be actually, the whopping model is very sensitive to the precision of the parameters. So if we have a lower precision like six bit, it never works. So in everyone we support the hybrid framework. So uh, we support two modes here. One is global whopping, the other is local whopping. And they can be picked at block level. Uh, so we do not force uh, frame level whopping at all. So uh, for global whopping, the concept is straightforward. Uh, the model will be estimated from the decoder encoder side by some kind of feature matching. And the parameter will be conveyed at frame level. And it works great with, with uh, camera motions like panning, zoom, and rotation. And we also support local whopping to uh, implicitly signal whopping parameters for individual blocks. The, the motivation to do it is uh, the, all the real-time motions cannot be simply represented by affine or it cannot be represented by homographic uh, even. So we estimate the, the local uh, whopping uh, models by uh, linear square feeding from the conveyed uh, neighborhood motion vectors. So neighborhood different, have different center points and the, the center points are projected to different, uh, by different displacement. So um, then the decoder can, uh, can, uh, can reproduce the whopping models by doing a low complexity uh, four parameter least square, which is actually quite light at the decoder side. So combining the two models together, we, uh, everyone works great with videos uh, with um, either global motion or a very, um, a very intense uh, local warping like rotation and uh, it works great in some graphic uh, contents as well. So yeah, that's pretty much how we do the prediction. Now after the prediction is done, we need to handle the residual and transform domain. There are two elements of transform coding. One is the transform kernel, the other is transform size. So for the kernels, uh, we extend the kernel set to a set of 16 separable 2D kernels, so, uh, which means at horizontal direction or vertical direction, we can have uh, four different kinds of kernels. So the four kernels includes DCT, which works great in general, and uh, also ADSD and flip ADSD, which means asymmetric sign transform. Those kind of transform will capture uh, monotonic changes in, uh, in the residual energy. And the other one, which is cool here for uh, artificial contents, is identical transform. It basically means no transform, but, it's, uh, but it works efficiently for sharp edges uh, it works better than uh, a particular uh, than uh, traditional uh, DCT and DST. Then this is the kernel. Then when we partition the prediction block into a different size of a transform blocks, because in every one we have so many uh, uh, types of prediction block sizes. We have square, we have one, two, 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 one, one, two, four, four, two, one prediction sizes. So we kind of upgraded the everyone uh, transform kernel size uh, to, uh, uh, to, uh, to make for transform coding uh, fitted in that framework. So also to support uh, the bigger uh, partition size from 128 to 128, everyone also started from a bigger transform size of 64 by 64. And also when partitioned it, we support a quartree based uh, recursive partition, which means in different areas, you can choose uh, how, how, uh, how deeper you want to partition. So this is a transform coding. So after transform coding is done, we have to spend a lot of bits on transform coding the transform residuals. Then uh, I like to talk about entropy coding. 
So I'd like to start from the general idea of entropy coding AV1. So in AV1, we use uh, symbol to symbol adapted uh, multi-symbol uh, arithmetic coder. The reason to do multi-symbol coding is most of the syntax elements has non-binary and very long alphabets. So to do multi-symbol coding, the, uh, the codec can do, um, can have higher throughputs when, we, uh, when it uh, decodes the symbols and coefficients. And also, uh, by supporting multi-symbol multi coding, the probability table update becomes more straightforward for the codec. Then specifically, everyone arithmetic coding is based on 15-bit CDF tables, and those tables are tracked from symbol to symbol. Then for transform coding co coefficients, because we spend a lot of bits on uh, most of the bandwidth on it, then uh, we do it in a smarter way. So because uh, for transform coefficients, a lot of bits are spent on lower value uh, coefficients. So we could decompose a transform block into level planes. The first plane starts from a map of zero or non-zero. Then for low levels, because we spend most of bits on it, then we have designed a richer context to code it efficiently. Then that's pretty much for, trans uh, for entropy coding and coefficient coding. Then the last step, uh, but also, but not, uh, but, but probably uh, a very impo important step is restoration to mitigate the compression artifacts. Then in VP9, um, we only have in loop deep blocking filters. Then AV1 extend the deep blocking filter framework to support adaptive strengths at block level and at, uh, for, at, um, at, for, at, and for adaptive for different color planes and also adaptive for different directions. Then besides in-loop deblocking, we also have two different kinds of uh, restoration following it. Um, one is directional enhancement filters. The idea is uh, the edge directions will be estimated at block level. Then we apply a pre-designed five by five uh, pre uh, detail preserving deraining filters to make the edges look better. Then another idea is to do in-loop restoration filtering. It's a little bit different from uh, edge, the edge preserving filters but I talked about before because that part is more like a blind restoration and this part is more like we compare the uh, reconstruction so far with the original video and ask to do list and mean square fitting from encoder side and convey the restoration filters directly. So there are two types of restoration filter uh, supported here. One is a very simple Wiener filter. The other one is a self-guided projective filters. The idea of projective filter is we use uh, two uh, cheap uh, edge preserving filters with different parameters. Although not, uh, maybe they individually they don't work great, but we project the two filters on, uh, onto the subset space of the original video and get the and get the lean, uh, parameter in linear combination that can project them that can f um, uh, produce the best projected prediction. Then the then we can uh, we are able to yield a much better final restoration here. And then we compare uh, we convey the linear combination weights and uh, the parameters of edge preserving filters directly to the decoder. So this is pretty much how we do in-loop restoration in the conventional coding scenario. Uh, another feature is called frame super resolution. And it's particularly designed for uh, some encoding at low bit rates for uh, perceptual quality. So the idea is everyone support a frame to be coded at a lower uh, resolution uh, here we say horizontal resolution because we don't want to want to have more uh, line buffers in hardware. Then the we code it at lower resolution, and before it will be used as a reference frame, we do uh, upscaling and the restoration. Then actually, only do upscaling is not enough. 
So we kind of borrow the idea of the guided restoration I talked before and gather better uh, reconstruction results for the future frames to use. Then another feature in the post-processing part is called film grain. Actually, um, I will hand over this part to uh, Andre from Netflix because he is the uh, expert on it and actually uh, uh, Netflix make it happen in AV1 which is pretty great for commercial content providers. Then, yeah, co compression performance comparison from our side. So the results I showed today is based on a test set uh, that we use in, by, uh, in AV1 development. Uh, which is used by the whole aliens. The set is called Objective One Fast AWCY. And you can find the configuration and download the video from the links below. Then the set consists of 30 frame, uh, 30, uh, 60 frame video ranging from 10 to 80p to uh, 360p uh, clips. And, and we run AV1 and VP9 in constant quality mode, which uses a fixed set of QP for different types of frames. And we run X.265 in placebo mode plus uh, CRF mode. CRF, uh, we found that we use CRF because we feel like CRF has the closest concept of uh, close to uh, constant quality mode. Then, the numbers that we, I show here is very reduction on the different distortion metrics. So unfortunately, we don't have uh, average PSNR implemented in our platform, open platform. So I show uh, the metric, uh, separate metrics. Then I, so to combine them, I show a, number, a metric called CIEDE, which av basically average the distortion across different color planes. Then for AV1 versus VP9, we got 29.8% uh, bitrate reduction. And AV1 versus X.265 placebo, we got 346.6% uh, bitrate reduction. And I also listed AV1 speed one here is, the reason is uh, actually in the past uh, one or two months, we worked really hard in speed one. Speed one is um, a lot faster, something like a lot faster than speed zero probably maybe a few weeks back it's like eight times faster than speed zero, but we only lose about our 1% quality in quality. Yeah. And I also borrowed some results from recent Facebook tests. Uh, the reason I want to show the figure here is um, to show everyone that uh, the benefit of AV1 will be big, more and more prominent when we move towards higher definition. Which, uh, which is good for in the day of increasing demand for HD content. And the link is also listed there. There are more results on the website. Then we also have a demo here. So David, could you help me? Oh, okay, great. So th what the demo shows is we compress to 720p clips in very similar quality. I can tell you the PSNR is about 40 dB. Then the bars shows the real time uh, uh, bit rate. Oh, yeah, it ends. Never mind. So, so you can see the bit rate uh, well. So it has been reduced a lot. And overall, for this clip, 20 second clip, everyone uses 40% uh, less bit for, uh, compared to VP9. So, yeah, people may be. Very interesting in coding complexity. Maybe you haven't read about some crazy four-digit number of um, how slow it is. So the, the truth is we're really, uh, working really hard to speed it up in the past uh, quarter. So uh, I showed the results. Uh, I directly pulled the result from the daily uh, testing uh, platform we use internally at Google to uh, monitor the tip of a tree of AV, AV1. So for uh, A32 by 480 clip at 8 bits, the encoding time versus VP9 is uh, 59x. Then the decoding time is uh, a little bit less than 5x. Then for a 10-bit clip, which uh, the resolution is 360p, then the encoding time is 41x and decoding time is uh, 4.6x. 
and we are working hard to make uh, more speed up. Uh, and uh, yeah, I think uh, there are a lot of potential there. So yeah, now the pre uh, basically the bitstream is almost finalized, and what we will do next, what, what, what can be expected. And the top priority is, of course, speeding up the codec. So uh, we haven't focused a lot on the encoder side. So from now, we, are, uh, we started to do more SIMD coverage at the encoder side to make it faster. And we also have a, a started a machine learning-based fast mode determination there. Actually, uh, the machine learning framework, some of them has been in speed one and speed zero. It works great for transform kernel selection and partition selection. And also, besides speed one and speed zero, uh, we're, we're, in the, we're in the middle of setting up uh, and tuning the low, lower complexity mode, like speed two to eight, which might be possible for real-time encoding. Then, uh, besides the speed up, uh, the compression performance can be further improved because uh, we are not fixing the encoder at all. So we can, uh, there are a lot of directions we are currently exploring. For example, better rate control mode and also adaptive quantization for different usage cases like, um, like either for compression quality, objective, under object, objective metric, or under usage like perceptual quality mode. And also, I have talked about frame super resolution in low bitrate cases. So there are pretty much a lot to explore in Next. But um, everyone, is, everyone is pretty young, and uh, we're, we're happy that it has achieved so much by so far. And uh, we are excited about the future development. And welcome to join the aliens to make everyone better. Yeah, thank you. That's pretty much it. Thank you.